you, God.
Father, we just honor your presence. To honor your presence is to honor your fatherhood. We honor you this morning, Father. We honor you. We acknowledge that you're here. Lord, among the generations. Your heart for family and legacy. Somehow, we've obtained your pleasure. Father, thank you for being here. We just honor you. We honor you, Father. We honor you. We honor you. We honor you. We honor you. Something about this moment is pleasing to him. That's how we've chosen our live our lives together. Both interracially and generationally. He's here right now. Because it's bringing his heart pleasure. Father, thank you for this family. Thank you for the presence of your fatherhood. It's dwelling in our midst. We honor you. Let the way that we live together bring glory to your name in the earth. We honor you. We honor you. Could you just honor him as a father right now? Just honor him just for a moment.
Don't you just love who he is? Not just his presence, but who he is. Just tell him, say, Daddy, I love you. Papa, I'm thankful. see God moving through this place right now. He's moving through the generations. He's the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. When he looks into the earth, he sees generationally. Tony and Helen, if you could just walk down to the front. I just feel like there's God's going to meet you here. It's like you just come to the altar. Tony and Helen, if you just come. There's a generational blessing that's coming upon you. Just come right here. Just come right here. things that other generations have given their life for that are coming to you as an inheritance. There's going to be things that you say and things that you do and you're going to go, where did that come from? That's wisdom beyond my years and beyond my understanding. And the generation of blessing is going to come upon you and your children. Divine favor is going to be upon your household. But even greater than that, you're going to understand what it is to live in the pleasure of your heavenly father. There's a great ministry calling upon the two of you. that you haven't fully understood. And I hear the Lord saying, I'll make it known to you in the days ahead. It won't be the ministry calling that you walk in that will be important. You understand what we've received as sons and daughters. And God is going to do something magnificent through you in your generation. And that which others have labored for that will be handed to you will not be dropped. For I hear the Lord saying, I'm marking you this morning as legacy carriers to carry an inheritance and a revelation of knowing who God is into your generation. Right now, there's like a baton that's like being handed to you right now. If you could just lift your hands right here in the presence of God. Say, Father, I receive it right now. Come on, just three times, holler out. Father, I receive it right now. One more time, just shout out, Father, I receive my inheritance in the presence of God. Come on, you're going to begin to feel the power of God just come all over you right now. When I count to three, it's just going to intensify. It's already building on you right now, but when I count to three, it's going to intensify. Just get ready to receive. There's a, it's, not just the, it's not just power, but it's presence. It's glory. Father, just begin to release, Lord, the kabod, the weight of your glory upon them and their home. One, 
two, three, right there it is. There it is, there it is, there it is. There it is. It's just falling all over you right now, Helen. Just receive right now. It's the glory of God that's coming. It's coming upon your home. Your children are going to begin to have visitations. Just receive. Right here, Tony, it's just increasing on you right now. You're going to carry the ark of God's presence. You're not only going to be a man of stature and wisdom, but you're going to be marked by the presence of God. When you begin to speak, the presence of God is going to begin to fall in the room. The presence that you're going to entertain and the presence that you're going to know, you'll invite others into it as you re reveal it to them through your life and your gifting and your calling. Hear the Lord saying, right now I'm increasing the presence of God upon your life because of the purity of your heart. And your willingness to be a son is pleasing to me, says the Father. Come on, just stretch your hands toward him right now. Just say, Father, release your glory. Father, release your glory. The two of you right now are just being marked by the presence of God. Just come wrap your hands around him. Just put your arms around him. Is there something about your sonship? Just wrap your arms around him. Talk. Can we just lift our hands and just honor God's presence that's here? Just do that. Just look at somebody next to you right now and just say, Don't we have a good father? Can you do that? Just hug somebody next to you and just say, don't we have a good dad? Guys, God's going to do something in your heart. You got a good heart. It's like a mark of sonship that's on your life. Even though you've had struggles and rejection from natural dads, your heart. God's looking at your heart. He's going to raise you up to be a father to a generation that has been orphaned. Just, if you don't mind, can you just stand up and just slip your hands in here, right here? Just say, Father, I thank you. I'm a son. Just tell him, say, thank you for never letting me go. Lord, we thank you right now over this young man's life. Lord, every orphan spirit is being canceled out in the name of Jesus. And every form of rejection from earthly fathers is broken right now so that he can receive and walk in his true identity as a son. This man is very important to the things of God. Father, right now, we thank you that you're marking him. You're marking him. Come on, Jason, just begin to pray for him for just a minute. There's something about your own journey and your own process. Just begin to pray for him, Jason. Shikalabasanda. Sonda.
Well, hallelujah. Look at somebody and say it feels good to be in church. Okay. Well, I think we have some announcements. We've got our official video announcements launched. And I think we've got a new personality up this morning. And uh, he's a son in this house as well. So let's just receive the son as he gives, brings us the announcements this morning. Good morning, everybody. My name is Wesley Jones. I'm a part of the leadership team for our RISE group, and I'm so thrilled to have you here this morning. If you're visiting for the first time, I encourage you to make your way to our Connect table. We have a gift for you. And if you are visiting via live stream, once again, I'm glad you're here. Corporate prayer is this Monday at 7 p.m. We say that corporate prayer is the most important meeting of the week, so I encourage you all to show up. Life groups are this Wednesday at 7 p.m. This is a time of building relationships, diving deeper into the word, and you get some pastoral care as, as well. If you want to join a life group, once again, I encourage you to visit our Connect table in the foyer. RISE is also meeting this week. RISE is for our career and college age group. This is Wednesday at 7 p.m. It's a time of fellowship, worship, and once again, jumping into the word. Today, immediately after service, we have a women's luncheon. Ladies 18 and older are welcome to join us and share lunch together at the Hibiscus. Thank you for visiting with us, and I hope to see you next week. Ed Wesley. I said, go ahead, Wesley. You're doing all right. Making us look better than we really are. Well, we're going to get ready to give right now. It's tithe and offering time. And I was thinking this morning about the message that Glenn Middleton brought us last time he was here. And he was talking about sowing a seed. And you sow the seed to receive the harvest out of this, the seed that you plant. So I know over the years that message got abused. But there's something about sowing into God's kingdom that you, when, what you sow, you're going to reap. The scripture is very clear on that in Galatians. And so this morning, we're just going to give you the opportunity to sow a financial seed into the kingdom. And we're going to expect a harvest not only in, in the kingdom, but also in your finances and your resources. So there's several different ways to give. You can bring an offering, write a check, make it payable to CLF. You can also give online or you can give it through our texting app. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to sow. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to sow specifically a financial seed, Lord, into your kingdom and into the field of the work of God. And Lord, we're expecting not only a harvest, Lord, of souls in your kingdom, but Lord, we're also expecting a financial reward to come back to our life. And Lord, we thank you, God. We call it forward and we call it forth in the name of Jesus as we invest in your kingdom. And we believe in faith as we sow this seed in faith. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Well, we're going to release our kids right now. Kids in Christ's kingdom, they can be dismissed. And have Josh Fisher come to the pulpit. So, yeah. We walk a lot of life together, and uh, I tell you what, it's been, a, it's been a journey. I was there when he got born again. I cast demons out of him. Little did I know he's going to be my future son-in-law, <laughs> and that I was going to end up mentoring him and pouring into his life and leadership, and, you know, I'm so grateful. You know, you, you think about your kids getting married, and you don't know what you're going to get, but you know what I got? I got a son, and th this, this guy is just as much a part of my family as my own kids, and so I really appreciate him. He's awesome. He works really hard around here. Do you guys appreciate it, all that he does and who he is? Yeah. Come on, let's just stand on our feet. Can we stand on our feet one more time? Come on, just point your hands towards him right now.
can you just point your hands and just say, let the next generation speak. Say, Josh, we give you permission to speak the word of the Lord to us. We receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go get them, baby. Am I on? Ah, there we go. Man. Oh, man, it's so good to be up here. Isn't Jesus good? The presence of God was amazing this morning. I was just, uh, I was sitting there and, you know, the message I'm going to bring today, it's a little hot up here. I'm ringing real bad. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's hard to hear yourself. It's like it starts ringing. Um, I was sitting up here during worship and thinking about the message that God gave me and just how it's really, uh, you know, it's, it's not just something I learned by reading the Bible, but it's really something God's laid on my heart by watching the fathers and mothers in this church. And it's something I was taught um, by Tom Bedford when I first got saved and the message and, and the life of it was imparted in me. And then it's something I've watched the fathers and mothers in this house walk over and over again and how my life is a testimony of that. And, you know, we are, we are just so blessed to not just be in a church of young people. And all, when, it, when you get on YouTube, you see all these young people movements all over the place. But there is something so rich and real when you have fathers and mothers pouring in things that they've learned over years and years of walking with God, and you have the chance to receive that, and the seed of that takes root in you. And, uh, and so the message I'm going to bring today is really, it's the fruit of what you guys have lived your lives for, the fathers and mothers of this house. And, uh, and so I hope that, uh, that you guys can receive this. I think um, this is something that, like I said, I've lived for, uh, for years now, and God's um, walked me through, but it's also something that this year God is beginning to really renew in my life, and um, and He's been speaking to me about it, and uh, and then when Paul began to speak about four weeks ago, I realized how how well this fit with where the body is. Um, so this morning I'm going to be talking about cultivating a daily prayer life where you can hear God and know how to obey Him. Um, so if you guys can put up that graphic back there for me. Uh, so about. I guess it was four weeks ago now, Paul began to, uh, he came up and he had a word from God. And how many know our pastor hears from God? Yeah. Amen. Aren't we glad we're led by a pastor who uh, isn't just coming up with good topics, but he's hearing what Jesus is saying for, our, for the body of Christ, for, for Jesus' body. And he's coming up and he's giving that to us. And so Paul began to talk. He said, um, when obedience meets obedience, there is a synergy and an inflection point. Uh, if you didn't listen to that message, you need to go back uh, and listen to that because that is where we're building out of. And so Shabaka came up after that and he began to talk about hearing and obeying and how it's necessary for us to hear and obey the word of the Lord and then act out of that. And that's the obedience meets obedience. And, uh, and then Paul spoke last week about how our self-will has to be crucified so we're able to hear and listen to God so we can obey him. And if we can have a prayer life uh, where we can hear God, then we can begin to obey him and our self-will can be crucified on the cross. And when that happens, there is, uh, when our obedience meets other people's obedience, something begins to happen in the earth and a supernatural moment takes place and the kingdom of God can expand and signs and wonders and miracles can begin to go into our city and into our nation, into our region. Amen? Amen. 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 So today I'm going to be speaking about what it looks like to have a prayer life where you can actually hear God and know how to obey. How do you create a prayer life where your self-will is constantly being crucified and surrendered so God's will can be done through you? All right. There we go. Ma'am, how's that? Better? Okay. Uh, so you were not created for just a corporate encounter or just a meeting with Christ, but you were created to have a daily personal relationship with Jesus. Can you guys say daily? daily. All right. Let's turn to Hebrews 1. We're going to start there this morning. Hebrews chapter 1. All right. I'm going to be reading uh, verses 1 through 3. 
Hebrews 1 says, In the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his, of the Father's being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he has provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So from the beginning of time, God has desired a relationship with his children. And throughout the scriptures, he begins to teach us the necessity of having this daily personal relationship with him. So all the way when we begin to look um, at Exodus 16, where uh, God comes, he takes the Israelites out of Egypt and into the wilderness. And uh, they begin to complain about um, uh, not having food and, uh, and not having what they need. And God says, I'm going to teach them a lesson that they would learn to obey my commands. And what does he do? He sends manna from heaven. And he teaches them and he, he says, every morning I'm going to send you manna. And in the evening I'm going to send you meat. And he says, but this, there's this really important clause in there. He says, but it will only last for one day. And the manna will only be good for one day. Right? Your encounter with the presence of God and the voice of God this morning during worship and this meeting is meant for today, but tomorrow there's a fresh encounter for us waiting. And just like the manna of heaven lasted for one day, each and every day we have the responsibility to wake up and say, okay, God, what do you have for me today? All right? And, he, and he, Jesus comes and he begins to teach his disciples this exact same principle and concept, right? We know the Lord's Prayer. He says, Our Father who art in heaven, give us today our Hallowed be thy name, right? Give us today our daily bread, right? He begins to say, hey, this is about a daily responsibility to come to my feet and to receive from me. And Jesus begins to model this same thing to us, right? He comes and we, uh, we look at his life and we read through the scripture. And the Bible says that Jesus constantly withdrew alone to pray and have communion with God. And, you know, you ever thought about this, that Jesus lived in the greatest move of God that ever existed, right? If we, if we look at the chapter of Luke, there's this moment and it says Jesus feeds 5,000 people from one loaf. You know, there's these insane miracles happening. People are getting healed. People are getting delivered. And then what happens? Jesus goes to the mountain and he goes and prays. He goes to have communion with the Father, right? And he's teaching us this necessary point. We cannot walk out the Father's will here on earth and we can't bring the kingdom of heaven to earth if we don't have a prayer life where God is speaking to us. And you know, there's something really interesting here. It's, it's what was Jesus doing when he separated himself to go pray? It's like, yes, we know that he says, he's like, I only do what the Father says. And so he was going and he was hearing the Father's will. But there was something that was much deeper happening that, uh, that's really important for us to understand and receive. See, when Jesus walked on earth, he was fully God and fully man. That's what scripture tells us. He was an uncreated being, but he took the form of a created being. And so because of that, he was acquainted with our sufferings. He knew what it meant to be human. He knew what it meant um, to be hungry, to be thirsty. He knew what it meant to be tired. He knew what it meant to, uh, to, be, uh, to get frustrated and be like, man, these, these disciples, they're just, how do they not get this? How do they not understand these? These Pharisees are full of religion. He understood all the, the human aspects of it. And so he went to the mountain and he had to go cultivate this prayer life where he received from God because he was praying through his humanity, right? Paul talked about our self-will being crucified, right? So we could take on his will. What was Jesus doing? He said, God, I, I surrender my will to you so I can receive your will so your kingdom can come in the earth, right? He was praying through his humanity. So Jesus was constantly in this place where he was laying down his humanity and he was communing with his um, communing with the Father so that way his humanity couldn't govern him. So that his humanity couldn't overrun his mission. And so the only way to truly yield yourself and the only way for us to live in the moment that we touched last week where our self-will is crucified is to constantly come in a place of daily prayer where we begin to, where it's this daily part of our life where we're saying, okay, God, your will be done in my life. Right, your will come, your, your kingdom come to the earth. 
And you know, this is, uh, this is a lesson that I learned in my life really early on. I got saved in this church uh, 10 years ago on January 4th. Um, and I came out of, uh, I was selling drugs, I was a mess, I was, I was just a complete absolute disaster. And, uh, and I got radically saved in this pastor that many of you guys know named Tom Bedford came to town right afterwards. And he said, you've got you've to get out of Raleigh. He's like, you know way too many people. You're, you've got to get out of here. He's like, the only way you're going to stay saved is if you come, if you come and, and leave where you're at. And so I went and stayed with Tom in Fresno, California. He's a pastor out there um, for a few months. And right when I got there, I mean, I, I've been saved a month and a half probably by the time I got out there. And right when I get out there, Tom's like, okay, this is what life's going to look like while you're out here with me. So we're going to wake up at 5 a.m. He's like, not even wake up at 5 a.m. We're going to be at the church at 5 a.m. <laughs> and we're going to pray in tongues. And that's what we're going to do. And so we showed up and there was, no, there was no end time. There was no, we're praying in tongues from 5 to 8. We're praying in tongues until... Until I say it's time to go and move forward, right? And, and we would come and we would show up and we'd, we'd show up, we'd go, uh, we'd go to Starbucks on the way there and we'd get uh, four shots of espresso because that's the only way you can actually make it, uh, make it through a prayer meeting like that at 5 a.m., I feel. And, uh, and we would get there and we would just pray in tongues, right? But this was a necessary part of my walk with God because I had to, in order for me to stay saved, I had to let the spirit of God go so deep inside of me that my humanity began to die. And it's like, okay, God, how am I going to walk this out? Right? And I had to let the spirit of God begin to transform my life. And that began, that was a process of not just creating, it was like the meeting isn't going to, to bring you closer to Jesus. Yes, that's a step and a part, but it's the daily cultivating prayer life where you begin to learn to crucify yourself and walk out a life with Jesus. Right? And so that is the, that's the application to our self-will has to die. It has to come to a daily encounter with God and a daily, and a daily moment with Jesus where our spirit life becomes more real than our flesh and what our humanity feels. And we begin to walk that out. And this life is, there's, there's constant things in this life that are pulling at our humanity. And it doesn't matter how long you've walked with Christ. I've been, I've been now serving God for a decade, but that, that principle is still required because every day I have to go, I have to get up, I have to go deal with bosses, I have to go deal with, with my work, I have to deal with customers, I've got to deal with family situations, I've got to deal with the political climate outside, I've got to deal with all the chaos of the world that is pulling at my humanity and it wants to pull me into, into my flesh, it wants to pull me into this physical world and God's saying, no, 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 you need to come back and learn what it means to walk in the spirit so you can hear my will and be above all of the chaos of the world that is drawing for your attention. Right? So we need a daily walk with God. Somebody say daily. Daily. Daily, all right? So we get free of our humanity through prayer. And the way to stay connected to the Father is through prayer. And our daily sin is going to go away when our daily encounter with God begins. Right? Our daily sin, our daily struggles begin to go away when our daily encounter with God begins. Let's turn to Jude 1, verse 20. Jude chapter 1, verse 20. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in the most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love. Someone say, keep yourself. Keep Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you into eternal life. Right? So I've got to pray to keep myself in Christ. Right? How am I going to pray about what job I need when I'm so cloudy? How am I going to pray about what spouse to take when I'm still in my flesh? How am I going to know what God's will is when I'm still struggling with my humanity? I have to pray. I have to go pray in tongues until, um, until I begin to walk in the spirit and I begin to hear his voice and hear what he's saying for my life. Right? Romans 8.26 says, In the same way the spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not... We, We do not know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Right? So I begin to pray until I hear God. 
So Paul began to talk about these moments, these supernatural moments that occur when we obey God, right? And it's like we have to hear his voice and begin to walk out in obedience what he says. And when he does that, the kingdom begins to expand. But if we don't have the prayer life where we even know what he's saying, how are we ever going to walk in obedience? Right. This is what Tom was teaching me in Fresno. It's like at that moment, all I was doing is I was just trying to, to learn how to stay. You know, I was just trying to make it through that day. Okay, God, what does it mean to be pure? My heart desires to be pure. I'm just going to pace and, and pray in tongues and keep going and praying in tongues until eventually I can, I can walk out a measure of sanctification in my life. But, the, but that's not the end goal. That's just the beginning. Right? The reality is we continue and we begin to live in this lifestyle of praying until we begin to hear what God's saying and we begin to walk it out. Right? So Sunday mornings, Wednesday home groups, they were never meant to sustain you. Right? Say that again. Sunday mornings and Wednesday home groups were never meant to sustain you. It was a personal walk with Christ. The, Israel, the Israelites tried it and it didn't work. Right? So let me ask you a question. Where was the destination when Moses took the Israelites out of Egypt? That's not right. It's not the promised land. Moses said to Pharaoh five times, let my people go so they can worship me in the wilderness. He never said, let my people go so I can take them to the promised land. The reason for that is because it was in the wilderness at Mount Sinai where Moses encountered God. And he knew if he took them to the promised land before meeting the promiser, they would make the promised land an idol. Right? It was the moment he had to take them to the person that he met. You know, it's really interesting. Moses lived in a palace with the richest person on earth at the time. Right? And the Israelites were in slavery and oppressed. The Israelites complained the entire time that they wanted to go back to their oppression. And Moses never complained he wanted to go back to the palace. The reason why is because Moses had an encounter with God. Right? And what happens? Well, Exodus uh, 19, 3 to 4, what does uh, God say? He says, I brought them out of Egypt to bring them to myself. That was the purpose. It was never the reward of the promised land. It was God was saying, I'm bringing them to me. Right? That was his original intent. But what happens in Deuteronomy 18, 15, verse 18? Can you pull that up for me? Oh, look at that. Turned right to it. That's faster. Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, right? The Lord, your God, will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. You must listen to him. For this is what you asked of the Lord, your God, at Herob on the day of the assembly, when you said, let us not hear the voice of the Lord, our God, nor see this great fire anymore, or we will die. The Lord said to me, what they say is good. I will raise up for, I will raise up for them a prophet, like you from among their brothers. I will put my word in his mouth and he will tell them everything I commanded them. So they came to, the Mount, up to Mount Sinai and they became fearful of God. And so they missed out on the encounter God desired for them, which was the daily relationship with him. And so what did they do? They asked for a prophet. They said, we want a prophet to come speak to us, right? And so God said, okay, if that's what they're asking, I'm gonna give them. But go back to Hebrews 1 where we started. What did he say? Hebrews 1, the very beginning where we started, he said, in past days, in past seasons, the voice of the Lord came to you for, through a prophet. But in these days, in the last days, Jesus is now speaking to us, right? And, and Jesus has now gone up to heaven, but the Holy Spirit is continually speaking to us in this generation. And so we have the opportunity to go back and say, okay, this was about the intent was that I would come to Jesus every morning, that I would come and hear his voice and hear his will, and that I would have that relationship that Moses walked in, the original intent of God that we would walk in that day in and day out. You know, I was, uh, man, this is probably like six or seven years ago. Um, I was sitting at David and Necca's table, and I was probably, I don't know what we were talking about, but they were probably pastoring me through something at the time. And, uh, and Necca's phone buzzed next to me, and I just like glanced over because it was right there, and a notification popped up on it, and it said, pray in tongues. And that's all it said, it just said, pray in tongues. And I was like, pray in tongues? And she's like, yeah, every hour I have a notification that goes off on my phone that reminds me to pray in tongues because I want to live a lifestyle of praying in tongues throughout the day. I want to live a lifestyle of letting my humanity die that I might walk in my spirit, right? 
As Paige tells this story. Uh, she tells it to me all the time. She said, you know, I used to grow up, and on Saturday mornings I would wake up, and I would come downstairs, and I would just hear my dad stomping on the ground, praying in tongues, ra ba 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 e sha ba 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 And she said that was a daily meeting. She's like, I watched that lived out in my life of Paul every morning waking up, and what was he doing? He was finding that moment in God and saying, okay, God, every day there's fresh manna from heaven that I have to receive so I know your will and begin to walk it out. And the only way that we have these supernatural encounters with God out in the kingdom is if it first starts in our daily prayer life, right? The only way that the kingdom can expand is if we first have okay, God, you're speaking to me. Every morning I wake up and I hear your voice and you begin to speak to me about what your will is and what I'm supposed to do and, and, and what your plans and purposes are and what are you saying for my coworkers and what are you saying for my spouse and what are you saying for my children and what are you saying for my boss and where do you want me to go and what do you want me to do? And when we begin to get out of our humanity and into our spirit where we can hear the voice of God and he begins to speak to us, supernatural meetings can come and begin to happen and it'll go out from this church and, and the gift of the spirit will begin to pour out and supernatural things will happen in the world but it has to start with your daily encounter your daily encounter your daily meeting with Jesus I was thinking about uh, Paul told the story a couple weeks ago about when uh, the pizza man came to his door and he said that the guy came in if you remember the sermon and, uh, and Paul began to give a prophetic word to the guy delivering pizza you're not going to have your own pizza man story if you don't have the prayer life where God's speaking to you in the first place. <laughs> All right? So I left that and I was like, man, that's great that Paul's got a pizza man story. I want my own pizza man story. All right? Somebody say, God, give me a pizza man story. <laughs> right? Yes, yes, say it like Kevin Lill. God, give me a pizza man story. <laughs> You got to have some growl in your voice, right? It's like, God, we want supernatural encounters to happen in our life. We weren't created just to live meeting to meeting, but we were created to have your voice moving and active. But God, if I don't have a prayer life, how will I hear you in the first place to know what you're saying? This morning, the presence of God was real. And every time the presence shows up, his voice shows up. His voice is in the presence. But... This, today's manna is not going to sustain you tomorrow. Amen. Tomorrow you have a fresh opportunity. Okay, God, what are you saying for my life? What are you saying? What do you want? What, what are you asking of me today? You see, the presence of God is always step one. Isaiah prophesied three times that the Holy Spirit would rest upon the Messiah. And he came like a dove, gently resting upon him. And so we have to wait and we rest and we wait for him to hover because when he begins to, to hover in the room, when his presence begins to fall, he begins to reveal himself and he begins to speak and then he begins to lead us. You know, in Genesis 1, uh, chapter 1, 1 through 5, I think it's a really interesting, um, interesting picture of how our own lives and how our own walk with God look. It says that the spirit of God was hovering over the waters and the earth was dark and formless. And in some way, our hearts without Jesus are really the same way. It's dark. It's formless. It doesn't have a purpose. It does, it is, it's lost. And it says the Spirit of God began to hover. Can we put that up there? Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. And then it says, oh. And then it says, and the Spirit of God. There we go. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And the very next thing that happens is, it says, and then God said, let there be light, and there was light. So you see, when we begin to pray and we begin to cultivate a prayer life, what happens is the presence of God begins to, to fill the room. It begins to settle on our hearts. That's what happened today, right? The presence of God began to settle in the room. And that's what our daily prayer life is supposed to look like. We pray until God begins to rest in the room. Because in the presence of God is his voice. And once he begins to hover, then he begins to speak. And then once he begins to speak, he begins to bring light into darkness, right? And once the light comes, then it is illuminated what his will and his plans and purposes are. Yeah, right? So our daily prayer life, what it is, is it's us coming to God and beginning to say, okay, God, I'm not here just to go through the motions of praying. And I'm not just here to pray through, through my daily checklist, but I'm praying until you show up. 
I'm praying until your presence shows up. I'm praying until you begin to speak because it's you I'm entertaining. It's not the action of prayer. It's not just the discipline of prayer, but it's the person we're praying to begins to manifest himself in our daily lives. Right? So we pray until the presence of God shows up. We pray until he begins to move in the room because that's when he brings light and illuminates where we're supposed to go. You see, we're not trying to accomplish something for God, but it's with God and it's through God and it's in God. And the presence of God is an invitation to know the ways of God. All right, we'll go back to Israel. It says, Israel knew God's works, but Moses knew his way. Right? Israel knew God's works, but Moses knew his ways. Why was that? Because Moses knew God. He had the relationship with God. It wasn't the prophet speaking to him, but it was the personal relationship. And when, we be, when the presence of God begins to show up, it's an invitation to know the ways of God, to know the heart of God, to know what he wants to do in the earth and how to walk it out. Right? The presence of God is an invitation to know his heart. So we were called to have daily encounters with the Holy Spirit. And this is really important because what happens in our daily personal life is going to be, what happens in, our, in the secret place, what happens in the closet when we begin to come and, and allow God to speak to us and he begins to, um, uh, to manifest in our daily personal life is going to be the thing that uh, generates and the catalyst for the supernatural encounters out there. It's... You know, the, the whole um, purpose of what Paul was talking about is that our obedience meets obedience, right? It's, okay, God, I'm going to allow you to come and speak to me in my personal life. I'm going to allow you to come and speak to me in my life. And when you begin to speak to me and I begin to be obedient, and then the, my neighbor in church begins to be obedient, what happens is that begins to create a synergy and an inflection point that goes out and it brings the kingdom of God to earth. And this comes down to, to reason of use. Um, you know, I, lo I love the story of David because it's, it's very challenging to me on, uh, on how this works, right? It says, David, when he was out in the field, he killed the lion and he killed the bear, right? It, it, and it said he had, he had these private victories that nobody saw. Nobody was aware of them. But it happened in his own private time with God while he was out there worshiping, while he was out there doing the things God had asked him to. And somehow when we begin to say, okay, God, I'm going to let you go to a deeper place in my life. And I want, I want you in a deeper way. And we begin to cultivate this daily prayer life. What happens is the private victories begin to become public victories. And the moment in our prayer life where we had the private victory and God began to deal with the things of our heart. He began to deal with our humanity. He began to deal with our self-will. That is the thing that allows him to take us and put us in front of two different nations and for us to kill a giant. Right? It's the private victory with Christ. It's the private moment. It's the, it's the prayer life that's cultivated when nobody's watching, when nobody sees us, that allows us to be put out there and say, okay, now the kingdom of God can, can happen and come to earth and out in the cities, out in the nation, out in our communities, out in our life groups and all these different areas. But it started with the private life. Right? It started with the, with the private victory. It started with the private prayer life that nobody saw that was generated morning after morning. It's our obedience. I think, you know, I begin to, to listen. Shabaka made this statement. He said, prayer unlocks the gateway to the supernatural realm. Prayer unlocks the gateway to the supernatural realm. And the supernatural realm is where we hear his voice. And somehow there's a call to all of us in this season. And it, it's what's going on. It's like, God, I want to hear and obey you. And that requires us to go to a deeper place. It requires us to go say, okay, God, whatever it takes, I'm willing to go to a deeper place and say, God, I want to hear your voice again in my life at a deeper measure. I, I've heard it in past seasons. But God, what are you saying for this season? What are you saying for this point in my life? And as a body, if we can corporately begin to have individual prayer lives where the presence of God is moving and active in a different way, in a new way, in a new season, it's like, what, will, what could happen 
if all of us begin to walk in that? What could happen in the kingdom if all of us had a prayer life where the Holy Spirit was speaking in a way that it began to bring supernatural encounters out in our workplaces? What could happen if, if, our, if, if there was 200 people where the presence of God began to encounter them in a way where they understood what he was saying and every time they stepped out into their job, every time they stepped out into the city, the spirit of God was resting upon them and they began to act out of what he was saying in his will and signs and wonders and miracles began to happen. Right, what could happen? It only took 120 people in the upper room. Right, what did they do? They waited, they prayed, they waited for the presence of God to show up. And somehow in the presence of God, there began to this miraculous things that showed up and 3,000 people were able to get saved. And it's like there's a coming back to an altar of, okay, God, I'm going to pray until your presence shows up. God, I, I'm, I'm giving myself to a daily encounter with you. I, I can't live on yesterday's season. I can't live on the stories of what, what you did in other people's lives. I can't live on, uh, on what you said in the prophetic word I got five years ago. But I'm looking for your voice again. Something deeper, something more real. And, and, and God, help me be obedient to that. It's like, God, give me ears to hear your voice again in a new way. When obedience meets obedience... That's when there's synergy. And there can't be obedience until we've heard God speak. There can't be obedience until we've heard God speak. And we can't hear him speak if we don't cultivate a daily personal encounter with him. You know, this is, uh, like I said, this is something that I've seen walked out. And it, it wasn't just a message that I read in the Bible. It wasn't just something that I heard Tom preach on. It wasn't, or Paul preach on. It was, it was something that God began to cultivate in my life. And somehow over this last few months, there's been a renewal of that. And it's like every morning I'm waking up and I'm like, God, I need today. It's manna. I need to hear what you have to say today. Amen. And as simple and as um, uh, basic as this is sometimes, it is the most important things in our life because it's the thing that connects us to him and his voice. And if we, if we miss this, we can't move forward. If we miss this message, that there, there is no next step. Right, this is the solution. It's the solution to our sin. It's the solution to getting out of our humanity. But it's also the solution for our city. Yeah. Right, my generation knows a lot of how to look good, how to memorize scriptures, how to how to sing a really good song. But they've missed the personal God. You're moving and speaking in my life, yeah. and all of us can become. Uh, calloused or we can become um, we just get into the discipline of it. Okay God I woke up this morning and I prayed. I did what I needed to do. I check marked that off my box. But somehow there's a, there's a fresh call even to our own lives. God I need, I, need a, I need a fresh prayer life. Because in order for me to be everything you call me to do and in order for my, my city to know you and touch you and be transformed. In order for me to, to move forward it starts here. It starts with you and me. Thank you. A praying people or a powerful people. Am I right? What I want to do right now is I just want to just give a response for anybody in here that's never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, and uh, if you've never spoken in tongues, and you want to pray in the Holy Spirit, you know, there's something about when the baptism of the Holy Spirit happens, there's a spirit connection 
that moves beyond your intellect or your understanding. My intellect can only take me so far. It's like I can only pray repetition so much out of my own mind and think about myself. But when the Holy Spirit comes and you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, there's this connection where you're communing with God that transcends your intellect and your understanding of your mind. And you're being connected to God in spirit who is spirit. And you're able to like pray in the Holy Ghost. And I like what Josh started talking about the children of Israel when they were brought to the mountain and they were brought out to this mountain and they went up and the thunder and the cloud and the presence of God came down and they all turned around and they ran and they said, Moses, you go to God, talk, let him talk to you and tell us what he says and we'll do it. That was the birth of legalism in that moment because we were never intended to serve God out of legalism. We were intended to serve God out of relationship and an intimacy with the Holy Spirit and the presence of God. I've seen people throughout the years come to meetings where we've had incredible breakthroughs, incredible presence of God moving, only to walk out of the meeting and go create a golden calf, go do sexual immorality, go get involved in all kinds of crazy things because my breakthrough is not a substitute for your own interaction with God himself. A corporate breakthrough isn't a substitute for your own prayer life. And it's like, in a, in, a, in a breakthrough moment, it's not going to sustain you the next day. It's daily bread. Everybody said daily bread. And so there's a moment here, if you're saying, I've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit. I don't even fully know what that means. We'll help explain it to you. But if you've never been baptized in the Holy Ghost and spoken in tongues, I want you to just get out of your seat right now and run down here. If there's anybody in here that says, I want to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. I want to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Anybody, anybody in this spirit-filled church? Okay, all right. We have one. Okay, praise God. Yeah. Praise God. Praise God. As she comes, I'm going to have Jim pray for her and just lead her in this moment. Maybe if Debbie Morgan's in here, or she's, is Debbie out? Okay. Maybe Anna, Anna, come and just be with your dad and help, help lead her. A couple of her friends, Gabby and Candace, she, all close to this gal, come. Anybody else? Anybody else? We, we lost the art in the church of getting people spirit-filled. We need to get, get folks spirit-filled again. This lady right here, she's coming. Okay. Angel, if I could just have a couple of people come. Kim, would you just come? Just pray with her. Receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jessica. Pray with her. Praise God. Okay, for the rest of us, I just feel like there's a just a moment just to come to the altar and just recommit our life to a, a deeper devotion of prayer. Can we do that this morning? Can we do that? A praying church is a powerful church. A praying church is a powerful church. Without a prayer life, there is no power. If you're in here and you're just saying, God's piercing my heart this morning, and I need, I need a deeper level of consecration in my prayer life. It's just all just come to the altar. This is just a place of where we're coming and we're just making a commitment right now to pursue the presence of God, to be in daily prayer, to get daily bread. So many problems can just be solved in prayer. Do you know that? How many have ever went into prayer and it's like I got all these things that are on my mind and all these problems and then I go in prayer and I forgot about all of them and I come out totally different. That's because you just got God's perspective and not your perspective. You got the mind of God instead of your mind. Hallelujah. Come on, just, just in your own words right now, just begin to just rededicate your life to a lifestyle of prayer. You're going to rededicate your life to a lifestyle of prayer. Come on, ask him that. As you get up daily, that he'll meet you and give you daily bread. He'll give you daily bread. Come on, if you pray in the Holy Ghost, just ask him for a fresh baptism. Sometimes you just got to be filled again. They did it in the book of Acts. They got filled in Acts 2. In Acts 5, they're getting filled again. Come on, you can be filled again with a fresh and filling of the Holy Ghost right now. 
Just begin to ask him for it. Seek, ask, knock. Shikara barara musana. Ya nala 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 musona. Ya rola musona. Oh, Rama Sirian, la 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 it was dug a long time ago, but it's been filled up with debris. Come on, just redig that well right now. Come on, some of you want to just sing in the spirit, sing in the spirit.
we're going to go ahead and release you and dismiss the meeting. But for those that want to just stay at the altar a little while longer, you're welcome just to stay and just linger in a moment of prayer. We'll just keep the worship team up here for a few minutes. But you're just welcome to just to stay. Join us tomorrow night at, at 7 o'clock. We have a powerful prayer meeting that goes on in the back. So please make sure that you make that a priority. Hug somebody's neck as you're going out and tell them, isn't it wonderful to be in the presence of God together? Would you do that? It's wonderful to be in the presence of God.